previously on Garage Fab. I have been asked to rebuild the air suspension of an old C10. I still don't have room, so his truck has to stay in his garage. I'm going to bring this truck to my living room floor. If this truck were to lay out, the upper link bar would hit the compressor rack. I will need to bend my upper link bar to 155 degrees. I'm getting nervous. I think it's time to make the trek across town and see how we've done so far. I'm back at Keith's garage. The left side of the parallel four link is in place. The rear is just held up by a jack and the front is clamped in place. And the original four link is still installed because it's holding the axle where we need it to be so that I can check and see how we did. And so far, I'm really happy with it. So to start, our rear brackets fit the axle nicely. The distance between the rear brackets and the front brackets gives us about an inch clearance between the cab and the front brackets, so I'm really happy with that. This is the compressor rack that we were talking about earlier. This is where Keith's compressors, and on the other side, his battery, and the bed mounts all attached to, so this could not move. So the clearance between the compressor rack and the top of the brackets is about an inch. Really happy with that. And on the bottom, there's about an inch clearance between the bottom of the brackets and the ground. So looking really good so far. With these shocks still installed, this rear suspension is currently at full extension. The rear axle cannot drop down any more than it is right now because of these shocks. The last thing I wanna check is the bend in the upper link bar. We bent that bar so that when the truck fully aired out, the bar would not contact the compressor rack. Right now, there's miles of clearance. But again, right now, this truck is in the fully lifted position. And this is the fully lowered position. And under the compressor rack, we have about an inch clearance, the entire length of the rack. It is another really good day. I'm gonna take the original four link off so that I can put my four link in the proper position for the last couple checks. The last check is air spring clearance between the frame rail and the tire. The airbag used to be mounted between the frame rail and the tire directly over the axle. Now we're moving it forward onto the link bar to get a little bit more lift and a softer ride. The plan when creating this front link bar bracket assembly thingy was to add this chingus that would reach out from the brackets to the inside of the truck frame rail, which we can't really get there right now because the old link bar brackets are stopping us. But once those are removed, this edge will reach the inside of the frame rail. And when that's in place, it should center the airbag between the frame rail and the tire. And so far it's looking really good. Now, Keith wants to increase the width of his tires a little bit, so I actually need a touch more room on this side, but I think we're gonna get there as soon as we cut off the old link bar tabs. And the very last thing that I wanted to determine today was where the bag was going to be mounted on the upper link bar. Right where it's sitting appears to be just about perfect. There's enough clearance from the tire and it's right about at the halfway point on the link bar. I personally would not recommend moving the air spring any further closer to the front pivot than the halfway point. And that's gonna depend a lot on the size and strength of your air spring and the weight of the vehicle. This truck has a pretty heavy bed, so I definitely don't wanna move it any further forward than the halfway mark. So I think I'm gonna put it right there. We're gonna mount it and see how everything works. And honestly, just crossing fingers there, hoping that that works out just fine. And if it doesn't, maybe we go with a larger air spring. So I'm gonna disassemble all this stuff, bring it all back home because now I wanna add some fish plates to the bars and build a support on the bottom of this bar because I've already found that this elbow doesn't get much closer to this bottom bar at any point in travel. So that's something I was worried about. <sighs> Time to go back home and get back to work. I've got Keith's axle back at my garage and I need to cut off the original link bar tabs to make room for my link bar tabs. So here's the current setup. These have to go, but he's got this support bar slash shock mount bar welded across both sets of the existing tabs. Also on those tabs are these things. I don't really know what they were for, it must have been part of a kit. He did not have anything attached to those. Maybe they were shock tabs, 
Maybe they were adjustable pan hard bar mounts. Either way, those need to go. The thing is, I don't wanna get rid of this bar. It's good on a bagged vehicle to have some sort of axle support, especially on one like this, where the axle tube is really long and really thin and the bags aren't mounted on the very edge. Ideally, that would be the best spot, but a lot of the times you just can't do that. So it's good to have a support bar, something similar to this one. So I actually wanna leave that, not to mention it'll prevent having to do some rework, trying to figure out a new place to mount the shocks so we can keep the shocks in the exact same place. So what I'm going to do is actually leave some of this link bar mounting tab and just try to clean up all the things we don't need. We don't need the old mounts. We don't need this thing whatever that is. So some of the tab is actually going to stay in place and I'm just gonna clean it up a bit. And this is what I'm left with after removing those plates. A whole lot of cleanup. <laughs> Keith's garage and I know it seems like I was just here two minutes ago. It's actually been two weeks since I was last here. Last week was just cleaning up the axle. And today it is hot. Wow. So you get to stare at my bald head for this next section because I, I just can't, I can't, I can't do a hat right now. Got the link bars clamped to the frame again but this time i have both sides in place and i've got the panhard bar installed which is the original panhard bar and i'm cheating and using that to help me center the axle in the frame because there's never a problem with the axle being centered and i now have the passenger side link bars installed and i found a couple of problems problem number one I can't get the rear brackets for the link bars to seat up against the axle properly because the bracket in the back contacts the panhard bar mount that was already there. That's not a big deal at all. I'm just going to slice this little horn off right here so that this horn can actually weld to the mount in the back. Problem number two. I designed these link bars with this compressor rack in mind, and all the measurements I took were from this side, driver's side. So see this inch clearance that we have in the front? Well, on the passenger side, we've got some extra stuff that I didn't realize is there. This is where the battery used to mount. The battery used to hang upside down in this box. Here's the problem with it right now, is that this will not clear this battery box, but Keith does not want the battery there anymore. I'm going to just cut it off, not a big deal. Other than that, everything looks really good. I'm going to determine the distance between the back of the cab and the axle before I do any welding. Once I do that, I'm going to weld the brackets on, at least just tack them in place, and then we'll weld on the front brackets. I am ready to start welding everything together. The last thing I need to do is determine what the pinion angle is going to be. And unfortunately, I'm running out of time. I can't explain the why of the pinion angle today, which is really important to me. And if you've been watching my channel, the why is pretty much the most important thing, but I just don't have the time for that. But I've got a video on the magic of the drive shaft and the importance of pinion angle. And when I do my wife's Mighty Max, I'll get a lot more in depth on why pinion angle matters. But on this one today, since I'm so short on time, I just gotta tell you that I'm going to match the pinion angle to the transmission output shaft angle. And since there's no place to measure, I'm just going to use the front crankshaft pulley, which will be at the exact same angle. Angles. So I'm going to zero out my digital angle finder on the crankshaft pulley. Then I'm going to set it on the flange where the drive shaft matches, make sure that it says zero two and pinion angle is good. Again, I'll explain more in the future. My apologies. Got to get back to work. After welding everything together, I decided to install the drive shaft 
just to make sure everything was all right. And it wasn't. The drive shaft hit this cross member when we put the suspension in the fully dropped position. It is absolutely baffling. The link bars are brand new, but nothing else has changed. The truck still has the same wheels, so the axle doesn't go any higher than it ever has. How then is the drive shaft higher? And then Keith says, could it have anything to do with a double carden joint? And I said, the what? I immediately dropped to the ground and looked under the truck to find a double carden joint. Yay! I highly recommend checking out my drive shaft video if you haven't already. There's a section in there where we talk about the double carden joint. In that section, we learned that the double carden joint has no business being on a parallel forelink. Needless to say, assumptions were made. I made the entire forelink thinking the drive shaft had a singular U-joint on both ends. Had I bothered to look and saw the double carden, I would have designed things different. The upper link bars would have been angled towards the lowers in the front, which would have increased traction and would have kept the pinion angle pointed at the back of the transmission, which is what the double carden needs. It's too late now. The suspension is already built, but pinion angle rules for a drive shaft with a double carden joint are different than a drive shaft with single U-joints. Rather than matching the pinion angle to the transmission like I did, the pinion angle needs to be changed so that the single rear U-joint is straight at half travel. Dropping the pinion angle will solve the drive shaft clearance problem, and we just have to hope that there's no drive shaft vibration issues when driving really low or really high. There's just one problem on top of this problem. Remember when I said I was just gonna tack the rear link bar tabs to the axle? Yeah, I pretty much fully welded them on. Now, I have to try to carefully cut them off without destroying them. That was stupid. It'd be a lot easier just to start over. Kinda have to start over anyways. That is destroyed. Well, I tried. I'm just gonna remake the axle tabs, but I'm not gonna make you watch that again. Hey! Oh, <laughs> so I'm back. <clears throat> Got a frog in my throat. I'm back at Keith's garage with my mock up air springs that I just made. If you haven't seen that video yet, go check it out. I just show how to make one of these. Uh, you can actually buy them, to be honest, but uh, I just like to make everything. So if you wanna see the video on how I made that, uh, go check it out. All I'm gonna do today is try to mock up some airbag brackets with the mock up bag. I usually try not to rush through stuff, but man, it is so hot in here right now. Uh, I'm, I'm definitely gonna be rushing this one. I think I saw a thermometer in here somewhere last time. Yeah, it's almost 110 and it's been raining all day. So it's super sticky, crazy humid and I am miserable. So I'm just gonna try to rush right through this, make up some bag brackets and get the out of here. I think I've mentioned it a hundred times before, but in case I didn't, the air springs are going on the upper link bars on this build. So today I'm just gonna build some brackets that go on the top of the air spring. I'm literally just gonna cut some cardboard, set it on top of the spring, try to fit it to the frame. And then once that's done, we'll figure out how to support the sides a little bit because these brackets are gonna have to lift the entire rear end of the truck. And I think I also mentioned before that the bed on this is heavy. I built it. It's like a tank bed. If tanks had beds, but it's, it's heavy. So again, I'm just gonna go to time-lapse. I'm gonna set up the GoPro while I work on one side. And then I'm gonna try to just flip that piece over and see if I can use the exact same pattern on the other side and if not, I'm just gonna have to do the whole thing twice. Oh, something I forgot to mention though, super important if I'm trying to kind of explain how I'm doing this. I have to set the rear axle to the fully 
laid out position for the size of the wheels that he's running. Because using this mock-up bag, this is assuming that the air spring is completely deflated. And if the air spring is completely deflated, the frame should be resting on the ground. So it can't go any lower than the frame resting on the ground. So the air spring is completely collapsed, which means when you air it up, you get all the travel that bag has to offer. So first thing I gotta do, set the axle to the height that it will be in when the frame is resting on the ground. All right, so I got the axle in position and the way I figured it out, I wanted to share, hopefully it won't be too confusing. The truck is on 15 and a quarter inch jack stands right now, meaning it's 15 and a quarter inches away from the ground. That frame is eventually going to sit on the ground. And his wheels, the total diameter is 29 inches. Half that to the center of the wheel is, what is it? It's 14 and a half inches. So 14 and a half inches plus those jack stands, which is the 15 and a quarter makes 19 and three quarters. And that's what I set the center of his axles to. So uh, that's where I'm gonna build the bag mounts. I am back at home with Keith's air spring template and I was originally going to cut this into several different pieces. I think it's one, two, three, four different pieces and then weld them all together. I've changed my mind. I'm going to attempt to simply cut this edge, flatten it out and make it out of one piece and then score it with the cutoff wheel, fold it together and hope everything works out. I think it'll be kind of neat. The wooden template is cut out, but I need to shrink down a lot of these edges 3 16ths of an inch in order to be able to use this with my plasma cutter because the plasma cutter doesn't cut flush up against the template. It actually leaves 3 16ths inch of material. So I honestly don't care about these outer edges. I'm just gonna leave those alone. But these parts that actually contact one another when you score it and bend it, and then the other pieces that actually meet the truck frame I'm gonna cut those down 3 sixteenths of an inch and then move on to cutting them out with the plasma cutter.
I am almost finished with Keith's bag mounts with the exception of some mounting holes, welding them to the truck obviously, but also completely welding them together. And I've got a bit of a mental dilemma right now. With the welder at Keith's house, I am struggling to make good looking welds. And I am very sensitive about how my work looks, so I would rather weld them together with a machine that I'm comfortable with. The problem though is if I take these across town and they don't fit properly, I may have to cut them apart or start all over, and I don't want to do either of those. So the question is, do I take a risk and weld them up here, knowing that the welds will be beautiful, or do I weld them up at Keith's house, knowing that they'll fit, but the welds may not look as good? I think I'm going to take a risk. <laughs>